I am Rick Larson, and I have the <clears throat> pleasure of being an adjunct professor here at Columbia Business School. Um, in my day job, I work in environmental finance, and uh, that's not the topic for today exactly, but um, it is in, in some ways as well. We have a great panel um, of folks today to talk about supply chain issues in the developing world and ways in which sustainability integrates with that. Uh, with, with that world, and uh, in the order in which they're going to present, it's um, Summer Rain Oaks, who is a fashion entrepreneur, um, sustainable fashion entrepreneur and an advocate. She just has launched a new uh, B2B marketplace online that she's going to tell us about called S Source for Style. Um, Jim Fowler is a um, longtime veteran of, uh, he's the managing director of the Tallier Trading Group, a uh, long time um, lots of experience, 15 years of experience building sustainable supply chains, particularly in Africa. And so Jim is going to talk about the issues that he um, looks at and works with in that, in, in that space. And then um, Mike Faraday is here from Unilever. Um, he is the vice president for brand building foods at Unilever um, NA. Um, responsibility for some very large brands here in the United States and around the world. And it's going to talk about sustainability and accountability at the, at the multinational level and how that factors into decisions that the um, firm makes, and particularly from a, from a marketing perspective. So we're going to let Summer go first. And um, I've asked them each to talk for just for about five minutes of, uh, about their sort of their personal journey towards sustainability, but then give us a little bit more information about their, uh, their particular area. And then we'll, um, if there are immediate maybe clarifying questions, we'll put it that way, right after their presentations. Uh, but then we'll try to leave as much time as we can for, for questions and answers. So let me let Summer start. Thanks. Uh, hello, guys. Thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Summer Rain Oaks. I graduated from Cornell University and did my, my background is in environmental science and entomology with a concentration in geographic information systems. So, um, I'm not coming from more of a business-based background, but more of a, like an environmental science background. And I transitioned into the fashion industry when I was about uh, 17 years old, working on sustainable development and design projects. So the first project that I did was was more uh, it was more of a it wasn't a business venture. It was more of a, a more of a project, and it essentially tied in. Um, environmental design with avant-garde photography and environmental education. It was called Organic Portraits. And that was my first foray into this, the space that sat at the nexus of sustainability and fashion. Um, and since that time, it's been a, a miraculous journey of, of basically creating something from the ground up that didn't essentially exist before. Uh, and I worked in the fashion industry on these projects um, uh, went in through the, the industry as a, as a model, but only working with more environmentally and socially relevant brands, which has become more of my um, mainstay. And after university, I moved here to New York City in 2005 and started my first company, which is SRO LLC, which is an environmental communications and market research firm, and had the distinct pleasure of working with a, a number of really interesting clients, ranging from Discovery Networks to Recycle Bank, um, which I know is Ron Gonan graduated from Columbia here, and he's now also a, a adjunct professor, I believe. And um, and Condé Nast and uh, and Hearst Publications and a number of others. That led me to a lot of my next ventures, which was combining um, a spokesperson, brand ambassador position within the modeling field as well as sustainability strategist for most, um, most of the brands that I work with. So I've developed a more environmentally preferable shoe line with uh, Payless Shoe Source called Zoe and Zach. We launched that last year in April of 2009. We had been working on it for about um, a year and a half prior. And then also a line of more environmentally preferable bedding and bath with Portico Home. Um, so we supply all the Hyatts and on, in Sears and Bed Bath and beyond. And then I'm now working on a project with a, a sunglass and optical company called Modo. Um, which is uh, sourcing through more sustainable outlets. It's first certified recycled um, eyeglass company um, with some programs that we're doing in Africa too. So that led me up to the, the next um, project, which was writing a book last year, went out on a book tour, and then 
ended the book tour in October of last year, which is when we started the market research for Source for Style, which I'll be talking uh, a little bit um, now. And it's essentially a B2B online marketplace that allows designers and retail brands around the world to be able to search, compare, and purchase more sustainable materials from a network of global suppliers. And um, we distinctly knew that just from working with the, my business partner, Benita Singh and I, who comes from a background in fair trade, um, working with fair trade artisan groups around the world and developing technical access to develop it for brands like Levi's, Nokia, Barnes and Noble's, Whole Foods Market, that we knew from being just being in the industry that sourcing is the biggest pain point. Um, with design and our early research found out that designers spend anywhere upwards of 85% of their time actually sourcing rather than designing and um, We looked at some of the current business models that were out there Which is like if you go to an Alibaba.com, which was which was bought by Yahoo or if you go to fiber to fashion, which distinctly um, um, Focuses on the Indian market or even MFG.com, which is Bezos backed um, none of our designers or retail brands were actually identifying them as um, items that they used within their sourcing. And they still found a, a huge amount of issue trying to find um, uh, suppliers. And we also found out that suppliers uh, were not showcasing at trade shows, which is one of the main ways that designers could actually get materials. And this was happening for a number of reasons. One, trade shows we're charging over $30,000 to showcase some of the major trade shows. And also the Chinese government and, um, was subsidizing it. So you'd get a lot of Chinese suppliers that had higher minimums, but so you would get all these suppliers that were under the radar who may not even have search, great search, search engine optimization or websites. So what we've essentially did is created a 365 day a year uh, trade show online um, where designers could actually, again, search for materials. Um, and we have a parametric augmented uh, dynamic search on the left-hand side. So you could look at for uh, knits or wovens or organic cottons. We're featuring about 30 different suppliers um, from 12 different countries. And this is incredibly um, arduous, too, because you are working with different countries. And in many ways, our team is speaking Hindi and Spanish and French in one day. Um, as well as English, so it's, it's interesting. But you could see an actual product skew, um, choose the color, the quantity. Um, this is our hand-pounded bark cloth from Uganda, actually. And we did 100 millimeter macro lens photography, so you could go over the, the, the image of the product um, to really see it in light. You could order a swatch which we suggest to our designers so they could feel it and then they could order sampling and production yardage right off the bat. This is actually sourced by Christian Siriano this season and he did these bark cloth belts, which was pretty cool. So again, it, it's, it's kind of using it also as a, as a marketing platform. And then we have tabable browsing where you could get technical textile specs, sustainability specs, as well as a story and photo gallery of really bringing to life the material that you're actually sourcing, and then the pricing and terms, so lead time and ship time. And the last thing I'm just going to mention with this particular um, venture, and we just launched this three days ago, by the way, so um, we've been in private beta for a while, but uh, a lot of folks are asking us, how do you actually accredit, um, accredit the fact that you're sourcing more sustainable suppliers? Um, so we've built a pretty robust materials and sustainability questionnaire. Um, a lot of it is based on the Eco Index, which is a more now widely accepted in internal environmental assessment tool for the soft goods and hard good industry that is a transparent, open source um, internal environmental assessment tool that's been developed by over 100 brands. Um, and it's, I'm convinced that it's probably going to be the the, um, the go-to environmental assessment tool for the apparel industry. Um, so it's, that's currently in beta, so we've actually incorporated some of those questions into our back end for suppliers. And if you say that you're organic, then you have to actually upload, name your certification body and your certifier and upload that digital reference of that certification um, in order to be considered organic. And then we go into hot button industry topics that look at like if you're sourcing wool it goes into um, like musling issues if you have silk you have different issues if you have bast fibers which is like hemp or a bamboo linen um, or uh, uh, flax 
it goes into understanding the redding process. So if it's whether it's water redding or chemical redding. But this is, this is basically how the material, like for instance, this is just a sample of the materials indicator and it asks the supplier, do you have recycled content in your material? And then it asks the supplier how much percentage of post-consumer recycled content, how much percentage of pre-consumer recycled content, and all materials claimed to recycled are third-party certified and upload that certification. Now, EcoIndex has this on a point system. We haven't incorporated the point system, though we can. Um, for us, it's more about, uh, about showcasing the transparency of the supplier and allowing the designer himself or herself or the retail brand to determine what is the best sustainability story for them. Um, and then this is a hot button topics, just for wood. Is wood used in your product? Do you have a wood buying policy? If so, please upload. And can you verify that your product is not from illegally logged forest lands? Um, and then can you verify that your use of wood is not degrading high carbon values in the ecosystem? And there's um, some more that, um, the, that you're sourcing with FPIC, um, free prior and informed consent. And then we have a link to FPIC if people want to know what that is. So it's about us educating the suppliers also. And then whether your, par your, your wood is third party certified. And if any of you know certification, it's not like a foolproof system. Um, depending, FSC is not great in certain countries. Um, we particularly work in some African countries and we know that FSC is a bunch of hakahui. So we also ask them like what country or countries do your wood-based products come from so that we could at least have that information so that we don't always rely on certification but we're, we're threading together a, a, a more unique story when people have um, more robust questions for us. Um, but that's about, that's about it, and I'm happy to answer any questions along the, the lines afterwards. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jim Thaler. I'm a managing director of Talier Trading Group. We are a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we are a specialty food development company uh, based in New Jersey. We, uh, in short, we do international programs for US, uh, US and European supermarket chains. So up until about six years ago, um, we were predominantly, uh, you know, European based doing the, you know, British foods, Italian foods, working with uh, French suppliers to develop uh, products specifically for export um, and so on. And about six or so years ago, we started getting involved in the into some emerging markets, uh, and, and most notably in Africa. Um, we decided that we would be the, uh, the first and only uh, company to get involved in African specialty foods, which, as you could imagine, comes with as many problems as you, uh, as you could think of. Um, that was then, you know, and back then it was all conceptual. It was all saying, you know, well, you know, if we can create great food products in, you know, in Italy or Thailand or where have you, why can't we do it in Africa? And, and you know, the answer, depending on who you ask, of course, you know, you, you could actually come up with an answer for that. There's a, you know, a pretty long list of challenges, uh, you know, even Summer had uh, alluded to, you know, challenges of working in Africa. It's, um, you know, from packaging to, uh, you know, a viable supply chain to all kinds of issues, you know, they're there and they, they are very real. However, you know, my, my own skepticism um, has since been alleviated. You know, back then it was all conceptual. Today, it's a viable program. You know, we have this, uh, the African Specialty Foods Program, um, from a development standpoint, is running in 16 countries in Africa. To date, we've worked to create over 820 products, um, which are now all in active distribution, both here in the States uh, and in the EU. To be a part of the program, uh, we basically have two requirements that are quasi self-imposed, I guess. One is that the companies be owned and operated, uh, African owned and operated, um, and that's for obvious reasons. And, and then, of course, the other part is that there be a sustainable business model in place. Now, whether we go in and help create that model um, is another story, but th those basically are the only two requirements we have. You know, for us as a private company, this project, this program has really been, you know, what I would think uh, is probably the best example of what a public-private relationship looks like. Because um, we certainly 
cannot do this alone. We do not have offices in Africa, let alone in 16 countries in Africa. We never will, by the way, um, probably. And, you know, so we need relationships with people like USAID, people like World Bank, from, you know, all kinds of donor communities, NGO communities, African governments, um, and so on. We, we depend very heavily on them for on-the-ground on support, logistics, and so on. So it, it, it really has worked out um, quite nicely. Um, you can see on the slide here, you know, it's just kind of an example of what an African section looks like in a U.S. supermarket. I believe this one is from Wegmans. Um, if any of you have them nearby, buy something, please. Um, <laughs> So, you know, and then of course, you know, in, in partnership with a lot of these governments and NGO groups, you know, of course we pay for signage, events, and so on. You know, we're, we, we have the job of not only creating the category, but also marketing the category. And, you know, by, out of curiosity, by show of hands, how many people are going out for African food this evening? There you go. So that's, that's why we need as much support as we can get. Um, you know, we do a lot of work with U.S. agencies as far as promoting the concept of Africa as a destination for culinary cuisines. You know, pick, pick your country, you know, Senegal, Ghana, Ethiopia, South Africa, you know, and many more, all have very tangible culinary traditions. You know, when you're in Senegal, if anyone's been to Senegal, you know you're in Senegal. You know the food is phenomenal. You know, it's a very unique uh, dining experience, and it's comparable to Thai food, to Japanese food, Italian, all the other categories that, that you know, we as consumers have embraced so readily. So, so why not African? And this is the question we posed to ourselves uh, way back when, and um, well, and this is the answer. So promotion, obviously, very heavy. As far as social initiatives go, and I... My slides were done pretty hastily, so I apologize. Um, anyway, um, you know, as far as you know, sustainability goes, you know, it, it's something that for us has been, you know, really front and center as as the program has been developed um, for a number of reasons. One, of course, is it's a new concept. You know, most African countries, you know, as most people I think seem to forget, you know, most Af countries in Africa haven't really been countries that long, so. You know, you can imagine what, you know, the food processing in Malawi looks like or, you know, what packaging supply in, uh, you know, where Ethiopia looks like, you know. So it's a very new concept and we want to see that continue to grow. So part of our agenda is to not only work with individual companies um, to develop sustainable value chains, to develop products for export um, and so on. But part of what we do is we work with you know, local governments. Um, some of the local NGOs uh, and donor communities and whatnot to develop uh, incubation programs on the ground. Um, Senegal is a great example. Initially, we had one company coming out of Senegal. They were successful. They were on the evening news. I was on the evening news, and the reporter said, "You know, well, you know, Mr. Thaler is leaving uh, tomorrow afternoon." Sure enough, you know, uh, the very next morning, there were 120 people in the office, in the uh, USAID office in uh, Dakar, all wanting to get into food exports. Mm -hmm. And some of them had companies and some of them, you know, just wanted to have companies. Um, but, you know, success breeds success. And, you know, the more companies that we get out there and the more successes they have, you know, every time, you know, every time the African category gets voted the number one emerging specialty foods category um, in America, as it has twice uh, in the past two years, or in the past two years, um, more producers are stepping up. So I, I think it, part of our role, um, just as an industry, is to maintain that kind of corporate social responsibility. It, it, it's kind of twofold. I think one, you know, it's a, you know, it's it it's the right thing to do. It makes us, you know, makes us all feel warm and fuzzy, and we sleep well at night. On the other side, it contributes to the marketability of the products. You know, for anyone who's done business in Africa, you know, you you certainly know it is not an inexpensive place to do business. Um, you know, we work with a honey company out of East Africa. I can assure you, it is the most expensive honey on the market. It's in Food Emporium. Um, you know, it's a good 30% higher. Well, you know, as a consumer who's, you know, struggling in today's economy, how do you convince them to drop another $3 on a honey, 
you know, I, I know the difference. I am a honey expert, uh, so to speak, but presumably most of us aren't. You know, honey is honey, and you know, you pour it in your tea or on a piece of toast, and that's the end of it. So why pay more? Well, you know, some people, lots of people, thankfully, pay more for that kind of sustainable message. You know, is the money going back into the environment? Is it going back into a sustainable value chain? So for us, you know, it becomes a very tangible necessity um, to enhance these stories as much as possible. Um, and then of course, you know, and you can see, you know, some of the certifications that we use, you know, everyone knows organics and fair trades and, you know, we, we do a lot of social certifications. One, one thing I, I, I always kind of press upon this topic is that, you know, Industry has the ability to push social agendas a lot more than NGOs or donor organizations can. I'll give you an example. You know, we were running a, a program in conjunction with an anti-malaria campaign. Um, and on one hand, you know, it was kind of a two-folded discussion. On one hand, you know, they wanted to raise money for the program and, you know, raise awareness and so on. And that's great. And that's, that's an easy branding exercise. You know, let's put, you know, you know, buy a bottle of XYZ product and, you know, 10 cents goes to malaria, you know, an anti-malaria fund. Great. That's easy. But taking it another step further, we actually partnered up with some distribution uh, companies who we work with in Southern Africa, and they actually distribute the bed nets. And, you know, they perform the educational training so all the bed nets don't end up in the river trying to catch fish, um, as so often happens. You know, it becomes part of the story. And, you know, for us, it's, it's a requirement. But, you know, but the point I was making is that you can take these agendas and apply them to business. And when there's a, when there's a dollar sign attached to it, people listen a lot easier. You know, I can go to a company or, you know, anyone can go to a company and say, listen, I want to do business with you. And here's what it's going to mean, you know. The U.S. specialty food market is in, you know, an eight million dollar a year industry. I'd like you to have a piece of that. Here's what you're going to do for me. You know, you're going to source ethically. You're going to get fair trade certification, which we have a government entity who will pay for. You're going to implement. It, it runs the gamut. We've done we've done women's empowerment programs, management training programs, you know, child care programs, anti-malaria so on and so on. I mean, the list goes on and on. You can partner with these organizations. You know, we had a great program we did with the Ethiopian Children's Fund to what started out as a, a branding fundraising exercise um, really turned into much more. We, we, we had a meeting with the, the Parent Teacher Association of this group, which is a wonderful group, by the way. Um, and we were talking about all the money that was being raised and all the books that were going to be coming and this and that. And and so we got around to the end of the presentation. We said, so, you know, any questions? And, you know, gentleman in the back raised his hand and, you know, he said, hi, you know, I'm so-and-so and, -so and uh, I'm, you know, so-and-so's father. Um, can you give me a job? Well, we could actually, because the company who we were working with through this branding exercise identified that this was, hello? Oh, that this was a, this was a very viable area for the product that he was growing and actually out, you know, set up an entire microfinance network in this region. So now not only are we raising money and awareness for this organization, now we're, you know, now, you know, they have a, a sustainable source of income. Um, so anyway, um, let's see here. And that's my contact information. Um, <laughs> So anyway, that, you know, in short, that's what we do. Um, you know, if I could you know, leave you with any point, I, I would certainly say that you know, a sustainable business model um, it, it should be a requirement. You know, and it's you know, it's it's a it's a marketing necessity. It's a, you know, particularly in places like Africa. You know, anybody who buy, you know, I, I deal with all the uh, supermarket buyers throughout the country. I've heard all the jokes. I know there's no food in Ethiopia. Ha ha ha! Everyone's starving. <laughs> I get it. I've heard them all. You know, so if you want to convince people otherwise, going into a market with no sustainable business model and a 30% higher price tag is not the way to go about it, you know. So anyway, thank you. And um... yeah, I think I'm going to say, um, I'm going to be saying a lot of the same things. Uh, because, uh, no, no, this is, this is perfect. So uh, my name is Mike Barry. I work at uh, Unilever. Uh, I'm the vice president and general manager of our um, our center store food brands, and so I have eight different uh, brand groups reporting into me, uh, including 
Uh, almonds, mayonnaise, wishbone salad dressing, skippy peanut butter. These sound familiar? Mm -hmm. uh. um, Lipton tea, uh, which I, I will be talking a little bit about. Um, what else? Slim Fast, believe it or not. Uh, our Noor products. Uh, many people don't know this, but Noor is, is one of the biggest food brands globally. Not so big here in the U.S. It's a dry, um, uh, savory product. Uh, and then ragu spaghetti sauce and Bertoli spaghetti sauce. Um, I am, uh, I've been in uh, basically the U.S. foods business for close to 20 years, working first at Kraft Foods and now at Unilever with a little stint uh, at an advertising agency. Uh, and uh, you might be asking why I'm here. I think I'm here for two reasons. One is, um, first of all, our company um, is dedicated against a mission of corporate sustainability. It's one of our core values, which I'll talk to. I think the second reason is I have gone through the evolution of foods marketing um, in the U.S., where we evolved from a situation where most brands were trying to promise uh, the absence of baddies in the product, right? So low fat, low calories, um, things like that, to a situation where many companies started promising, hey, we have simple ingredients. And I think we are now at uh, stage three where uh, people are wondering where the ingredients are coming from. And, uh, and we are starting to see, in fact, we've already seen um, that, uh, that that is where marketing is going to be going uh, in the future. And uh, there's a lot of implications to that, uh, which I can uh, talk to. Um, by the way, great to be here at Columbia. My dad and my wife both got master's degrees here. We have four outstanding offers to uh, second year uh, Columbia MBA students, so I hope they accept. And we're back on Monday for more recruiting for those first years who are interested. That's my plug, and now I will uh, return to this session. Uh, these are some of our uh, global brands. Um, so on any given day, two billion of the six billion people in the world use our uh, brands um, every single day. Um, some of these you'll recognize, some of these are our global brands. Unilever, unlike Kraft Foods and Procter & Gamble, our big competitors here in the U.S., has a truly global footprint. So half of our business is U.S. and Western European based. Half of our business is outside that. And we are the company that has uh, potentially the, uh, uh, the best opportunity to really try to grow in what we used to call the developing world, okay? In the world outside Western Europe and the United States. Why is that important? We are trying to grow our business in areas where we need to grow our sustainable sourcing. And at the same time, in our developed areas, all those consumers are wondering about the raw ingredients that we are sourcing from the developing world, right? And so there's a real imperative at our company uh, to get our sourcing strategy uh, correct, especially for those ingredients like tea, like palm oil, um, that we uh, source from more tropical areas, right? And here's our vision. I'll just focus on the, uh, on the top. Um, we basically want to double the size of our business in the next 10 years while reducing our overall environmental impact. Right, and our, uh, our CEO got in trouble at Davos two years ago because he started talking about how our sustainability agenda was more, impor more important than our profit agenda, right? And you're not supposed to say that kind of stuff if you lead a giant uh, global corporation, a Fortune 100 global corporation, but he did, and in fact, it's true. And um, as he said that, I don't think people realized he was actually making a statement about profit uh, when he did that. Because in reality, as we talk about sustainable sourcing, Right? There's tremendous profits to be gotten from that because sustainable sourcing can lead to an expansion in food supply, right? And that's the biggest crisis the world is facing right now. The absence of land, water resource, and people resource um, is putting a cap and driving tremendous food inflation, right? We have to get out to more farmers, and that means more local farmers with more infrastructure in order to expand the food supply to meet the growing population, an extra two billion people in the world between now um, and 2050, right? You can see, uh, as I said, we're the third largest CPG company behind Procter & Gamble and Nestle, and so we spend a lot of money on raw materials, 15.3 billion euros, 10,000 suppliers, and then lots of different places where we make our products. And so it's important what we choose to do. We have to do the right thing. We have no choice. Um, interesting, just fact on sustainability, if you look at the boxes across the bottom, um, really only, um, I think, 5 to 10 percent of our impact on the environment is actually what we do as a company, which is manufacture and distribute products. The bulk of the impact on the environment that we have is based on how the raw materials are created and sourced and how consumers actually use our products, right? And so, little known fact, 
but most of the uh, carbon emissions in our tea value chain are from people heating up the water to make the tea. It has nothing to do with our factories and growing the tea and the uh, agrochemicals we might use, right, as pesticides to grow the tea. All that stuff we'll try to deal with, but the big thing is actually heating up the water from an environmental standpoint. Right, you can see uh, our share of world volume. We focus a lot uh, on tea and on palm oil. Here in the United States, we also focus on um, eggs, um, and then obviously there's uh, other dairy ingredients as well. And I'll just hit on uh, kind of four areas that we're very focused on. On tea, we committed two years ago to um, source all of our tea for our two big global brands, Lipton and PG Tips. PG Tips is the uh, big brand in the UK um, from uh, sustainable sources, um, and that all of the uh, farms and plantations would be Rainforest Alliance certified. And we've already made uh, significant progress on this, uh, but we have more to go. Um, we are one of the largest users of palm oil, so we are the biggest margarine producer in the world and also the second biggest uh, maker of personal care products like uh, lotions and soaps. They use palm oil. Um, a couple of years ago, um, uh, Greenpeace uh, had, uh, had a bunch of folks dress up as gorillas and they actually climbed up on our uh, headquarters building in, uh, in the UK protesting the fact that our sourcing of palm oil was actually killing the rainforests and killing habitats um, for, uh, 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 for primates in Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, and so we were doing stuff. We ramped all that up in response um, to that. Uh, and uh, and uh, so now we are trying to lead in palm oil certification. Here in the US, uh, one of the brands that's close to my heart, and this is maybe a little bit less applicable, but we're trying to do the right thing for animals as well. Um, and go to cage-free uh, eggs um, in our Hellman's mayonnaise. Um, we've already done that for our Ben & Jerry's uh, products. And then uh, on Ben & Jerry's, we announced uh, that we were going fair trade, which is a huge um, deal for Ben & Jerry's. I can talk to that a little bit. Um, and it's a tremendous change for our business. I think it's 115 different ingredients across 28 flavors. Um, and, uh, and, and it's a big deal for Ben & Jerry's as well and fits with their mission. And I can talk to that if you'd like. So a lot of interesting stuff to talk about, and with that, I think I'll stop. Good. Thank you all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you all. Um, just a quick question for me, and then we'll open it up. When um, we've had, heard a couple people today at the conference talk about how sustainability has become, and sustainable has become sort of a dead word, that it, it's used so much now that everybody is sustainable. Um, so how do you, when you say sustainable and sustainability, what do you what do you mean by that? Do you um, and how do you um, how do you put weight behind that in your work? Any, anyone? Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It's uh, tremendously overused, and you know, one of the challenges that we always have is is to put those mechanisms in place to, uh, you know, to monitor and evaluate the process as it continues. You know, some things are very straightforward, um, organic, very straightforward. Um, beyond that, and, and even with organic, you know, it, it can get a little hazy. Um, you know, fair trade is always a big challenge for us. You know, it's, uh, you know, the percentages vary depending on the product you're talking about, and you know, it's never really addressing the entire value chain. It's always addressing kind of a core ingredient. Uh, so, I, I mean, how do we handle that? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I think it's a problem, though. Um, I don't know. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. How <laughs> to uh, handle it? Uh, we define it. I prefer a more broad stroke definition for sustainable. So we define it as more environmentally or socially relevant along the supply chain with progress along the supply chain because we acknowledge that it's a very complex term, um, that it is being overused, and that sustainability isn't always the end goal. It's um, about uh, using it as a source of innovation along the supply chain. And um, for us, it's more about backloading that with the, the information that we have, particularly, and I'm speaking on the, along the lines of uh, Source for Style or some of the brands that, that we work for, is, is in that tabable browsing that I was showing you, really conveying the story um, in a way that isn't, isn't so um, oppressive. And the way that I mean by oppressive is, you know, so-and-so went to school, and these are helping 
uh, you know, the battered women who are HIV positive in this little community and, and, it, and it gets to be too much. So it's about how do we tell that story in a really positive light in a way that, you know, people want to be a part of it and, and feel like they want to convey that story as part of their brand. And, um, uh, and that's done through part, partly getting all of that information, the 245 points of information that we're getting from our suppliers and ba basically taking a marketing background to distill that information and convey it appropriately to your particular demographic. Um, and I think that's more of how, how we're actually treating it. But as I said, so sustainability as a source of innovation will um, always look at how we could improve along the way. And the way that we talked about it two years from now is not how we're going to be talking about it now and is not how we're going to be talking about it two years you know, later, and to your point, it's it is a, it's more about the sources, like where pe where it's coming from. Uh, we're going to be showing geolocational maps as to like where you're sourcing to kind of get a real feel for, um, you know, the cooperatives or the suppliers where it's coming from. So again, gives it like more of that multimedia uh, imagery behind where that product is coming from and how you could calculate not only your carbon footprint but also your duty calculator when you're sourcing from different parts as you would in a, a supply chain that involves fashion. Um, so, and then the second, the second thing I'd also like to add is organic is actually complex and now that the um, FTC guidelines have come out with their green guidelines, they're cracking down on a lot of folks. So, you know, your organic could be on your farm, it could be on your fiber, it could be on your yarn, it could be on your fabric, it could be on your cut and sew or manufacturing facility. So it's about We've created iconography where you see where that organic certification is coming from, so there's so that there is less confusion in the matter um, uh, for the designer who's buying it, and so that our suppliers aren't actually getting in trouble, which again then reflects on our credibility. So. Yeah, and, and I would I, I think you're right. I think it's become too big a word, and so what we try to do is we try to keep sustainability focused very much against you know um, how do we make sure that the earth. Um, that, that what is produced and consumed on the earth can then be recycled so that a million years from now we can still be, um, still have a civilization on the planet. So that's very much in the environmental sustainability. Um, obviously social welfare is linked to that, um, but I think, it's a, I think it's a different thing. Um, and so uh, it is a good, big, juicy word, and, uh, and I think it'll fade a little bit. We actually don't use it from a marketing standpoint at all. And then when we try to use it from a corporate information standpoint, um, we try to be very specific uh, about what we're talking about. Just on provenance, I mean, this is a, I, I gotta say, what you're doing is a big deal. So what we are hearing from major foods customers is they wanna know where our raw ingredients are coming from, right? And so Costco, everybody knows Costco, the big price club chain, they demanded that we put um, that our peanuts for Skippy peanut butter were sourced from American sources only. And we started going, I'm not sure we can do that because we were just getting these big loads of peanuts in and we had no idea what the source was. And so we had to initiate a project to figure out exactly where all of our peanuts are coming from, right? Because for a customer, it was important that they come from farms in the United States, right? Same thing on tea. Where is our tea coming from? And we have competitors right now who are calling out, similar to your comment on Africa, tea from Africa, right? Which puts us in a bad position. We happen to source a lot of our tea from Argentina, which has less cachet. So this provenance thing, I just am like building off what you said. It's a critical thing right now. Uh, in marketing and in dealing with customers. Um, just on, because I've been working on palm oil a lot too, um, particularly for the cosmetics industry and with the Rainforest Action Network. So knock on my door if they come dressed in gorilla suits. Um, but uh, I mean, how, how do you deal with issues where somebody says, okay, now you have to source from here, and yet there isn't enough su sustainable supply chain, for instance, for like, um, for, for, palm oil or there isn't you know enough American peanut farmers for for peanuts like how do you actually deal with that and like do you come up with like a five-year strategy of this is how we're going to transition or yeah, yeah, you, um, yes that's exactly what we did we came up with a <laughs> seven-year strategy and so when this happened two years ago um, we said by 2015 all of the palm oil we use and we use about 1.5 million uh, pounds of palm oil a year um, all of it would come from um, sustainable sources by 2015. Because to be honest, there, was not enough, there were not enough certified uh, farms and plantations you know, making it. And so there just was not the supply chain that existed. And then plus, there needs to be enough time so that it develops and costs come down. 
right? Because uh, you, we, you know, to be honest, we cannot deal with higher costs because the the tricky little fact and the hidden secret is even though consumers say they like it, they are not going to pay. Most consumers, 80% of consumers, will not pay one dime more for something that's more quote unquote sustainable or sourced uh, from a good place. Um, there's only a very small percent, the top 5% of consumers that will do that, you know. And so the, for those folks who go to Wegmans, which is, a, which is a higher consumer demographic, you know, yes, we can do, you know, we can do that, but for most consumers, we have to, uh, you know, keep our costs in line. So don't, don't mean to be negative, but just the reality, yeah. Let's open up to sure. the audience. Um, and feel free to use the microphone or just uh, bell it out. So in the back. Yeah, um, Hi. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you choose the, the places that you source from, or the artisans and the, the farmers that you, that you source from? Is that for me? For, or for, for our first two speakers? OK. Um, my business partner worked, uh, is Indian, and she worked throughout India and started also a, an organization called Mercado Global, which um, developed technical access for um, Guatemalan uh, cooperatives and so we ended up going with the first 25 suppliers that we signed on were people that we both had ex or groups that we had experience with that we knew had a very strong powerful story not necessarily were fair trade certified because as he had mentioned earlier um, it's not all about the certification and actually some of our suppliers which are more um, artisanal can't even a, a, you know afford the three thousand dollar price point on top of that so we chose ones that we knew w had a great story, and two, most importantly, are able to actually get product to market. Um, so they have to compete in a designer world, so we can't necessarily be providing technical <coughs> access. So they have to be working with a nonprofit or for-profit on the ground that could help um, do that, and then be able to get product to market in an efficient way with um, acceptable leadership times within the fashion industry. And then the challenge for us is then to actually be able to communicate that. Like for instance, we just had a great meeting with Monsoon, large buyer out in the UK um, that does a lot of ethical sourcing, and they want peace silk, um, and which is allows the silkworm to actually emerge as opposed to boiling it in the water and hearing it scream. Um, so uh, so we, we're putting together a package to them to say, OK, here's the price points. Here's what you could expect from those suppliers, because it's really a new way of sourcing. So with our artisan groups, again, it's, it's that they have the technical access that they could actually get product to market. Um, but we are also looking at ways that maybe putting in a Kiva API to actually have um, consumers, even though it's a business to business marketplace, consumers as well as the buyers to be able to support um, local artisan groups. But fair trade is one of our, like fair trade and artisanal and cultural traditional crafts, which is often left out in environmental or sustainability speak, is, um, is one of our uh, pillars that we focus on. Uh, so it's, it's one that we are passionate about, but it's not exclusively what we look at. Um, yeah, how we decide where to go uh, to source uh, products is—it's it, it, not a not a not a terribly sexy answer, but we actually go where the low-hanging fruit is. Um, speaking specifically about the African program, you know, there's enough low-hanging fruit, so to speak, that that's what we've been able to go after. You know, any, anyone who works in product development knows that you know work you know working in a place like Ghana is light years different than working in a place like Mali. Um, you know, Mali is landlocked. Mali doesn't have the infrastructure. They don't have the industry, and so on. Um, so that's a big part of our decision, which, which again, probably isn't the greatest, you know, sustainable answer. But um, that's really how we started off with this program. Um, originally, we we started identifying markets that were very easy to operate in, not only because of their infrastructure, but also because of the quality of products that were being produced already. You know, one of the challenges we saw early on was that, you know, when you're working with African entrepreneurs, most of them are not creating products that have an export value. Um, I'll give you an example. One of our one of our new products, which you'll be seeing shortly, is a range of uh, East African barbecue sauces, uh, choma sauces. Um, the company who's producing them uh, was producing ketchup for the local market. And, you know, it came to us and said, oh, we want to 
you know, we want to export. And, you know, honestly, until, you know, until they, you know, come up with the marketing budget to go after Heinz, I don't really see the point. You know, nobody wants Kenyan ketchup. Um, <laughs> So, but they have the infrastructure, you know, if you can do a hot fill liquid with ketchup, you know, tomato based product, well, you can make barbecue sauce, you can make lots of other things. So that's, and that's how we select, you know, the companies we work with as far as the region. Yeah, I mean, on, I guess, unfortunately for us, I mean, it's it a lot depends on what the infrastructure is like, you know, we do a lot more business. You know, we do a lot more business in Kenya, as an example, than we do in Malawi. Malawi is an amazingly challenging place to work with. And you know, again, you know, this, you know, we're, this is a for-profit initiative. The comp, you know, manufacturers make money, we make money, everyone is doing this, number one, for the betterment of, uh, you know, of the societies that we're operating in, but they're also doing it for a profit. And, you know, we, we're, we're, we're not Unilever, by the way. So we, you know, we don't have the resources to devote to, you know, sending a team of 50 people onto the ground in, uh, in Malawi for, you know, the two years it'll take to, you know, get get packaging suppliers to invest in uh, development uh, and so on. So, anyway, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, hi, this question is for Michael, primarily. Um, I'm just wondering, what is the business rationale for a company like Unilever to, you know, engage in this type of sourcing? Is it just sort of PR and good corporate governance, or is it really affecting your bottom line? Probably two or three rationale off the top of my head. Um, so number one, if you are first to market with something that, for example, is Rainforest Alliance certified nationally um, in a developing, uh, in a developed country, uh, so in the Western Europeans um, or uh, in the U.S., then there, there is a marketing advantage. And so when we do testing and test concepts um, around uh, sustainable uh, product points of difference. Um, like Lipton Tea is Rainforest, Rainforest Alliance certified, um, we, uh, we actually get good scores and the marketing works. I would say that's number one. Number two, if we don't do it, our competition will. So again, I'll use tea. Um, uh, Bigelow Tea went almost simultaneously with us, and Bigelow Tea is not really that big, but they could have taken some share points away from us if we had moved at the same time, so it's a competitive reason. Short term, there's a cost impact, and so we've estimated the fact that we've gone uh, certified on T to cost us right now about 2 million euro a year, and it's going to grow to about a 5 million euro cost impact. Um, but I think um, the cost <coughs> is justified um, short term by uh, the first two things I mentioned. And I think long term, um, you know, T prices have come down. T is really easy to grow. You know, if you have a field in the right climate and a little bit of water, you can grow T. I don't want to, you know, make it too simple. But it's pretty easy. And so generally, tea supplies have increased over the course of time, and they can increase easily ahead of population. However, we're entering a stage in this world where we've used up the good land, and we've used up the water resource. And so long term, we are going to have to make sure that we have access, and, and this has come up several times from the other speakers, um, we're going to have to have access to more local farmers um, uh, to, get, uh, to get our tea. And we want those local farmers to be doing it in a certified way so that, uh, um, you know, so that it's done the right way, you know, from a worker standpoint. And so in order to keep costs down and to keep, uh, you know, keep pace with population growth, we, abs we actually have to do this. You know, we have to do the right thing from a social welfare standpoint. So I, I don't know a lot of this in detail. I'll give you a sense of some of the impacts. Um, first, there is an internal people infrastructure you have to develop. And so as an example, our company took all of our global brands and we, we did a thing called a brand audit where we went through and understood the environmental and social impact of all of our brands. That was costly. It took a lot of time. Um, and it took a lot of resources, right? And we had to develop a central resource to do that. Um, and, uh, and so things like that, building the infrastructure to track this. And I mentioned the peanuts. That was a new thing that we had to start doing. Um, and so uh, there's that. Uh, I'll give you another example, which is the whole Walmart initiative around um, you know, reducing environmental impact. I had to build a whole infrastructure 
around the world, Walmart's a global um, customer, um, to deal with their scorecarding. Um, and so there is a, an internal need. The external need is something that we've heard discussed, which is if we really want to access um, good product from local farmers, right, the idea of having to build co-ops and road and school and health infrastructure costs money and the business model is iffy, you know, doesn't really pay back. Um, and so we're running, you know, test projects right now uh, uh, to explore that, you know. And so you'll see if you, if you have the Unilever RSS feed, you'll see constant stories of Unilever, you know, building these types of facilities. And it's more than just the corporate greenwashing stuff, um, although sometimes I suspect um, it's, uh, it's us actually trying to build infrastructure, you know, so that we can have a, a good work population um, and, uh, and a more, uh, a better environment for the workers so we get the supply. I don't know if that answers your question. I have a question. Uh, in emerging economies, how reliable are the certifications, you know, such as organic, uh, you know, in, in where government uh, authority might not be as robust as, you know, Western nations? Um, I, you know, for the work that we're doing, like in Mozambique, uh, that you know, if you go through EcoCert, for instance, they have a head office and they send people on the ground, so that's generally pretty legit. But I think that there are some certifications that are quite tenuous, like we were ta discussing earlier about the FSC certification, how um, the regulation is not necessarily there in a lot of developing countries. So I think it also depends for us, at least it depends on certification. Um, and then of course, like the fair trade gui guidelines when it comes to apparel, is you know Transfair, which is just actually they just changed their name, right? Fair Trade USA, um, Paul Rice's organization out in California. Um, they have started to create like an apparel <coughs> fair trade certification, but that will take some time to actually get adopted. So again, I think it's more about um, each individual certification has its own issues. And if you don't have the regulation there, which often happens in some developing nations, but in some cases, like EcoCert, for instance, for us, it's been really helpful because um, they could come down on the ground in a remote area in Mozambique and be able to certify something. So I don't know what your experience is. Um, yeah, similar. I, I think, um I think uh, it depends on the certification. You know, for organic, it's a little easier because you know we we have a pretty solid partnership with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, some of the European counterparts. So they do they send people out, um, and you know really manage that entire process. You know, the, the the challenge, of course, I think, is to get the and and we see this all the time. You know, getting the African counterparts to USDA or whatnot up to speed is painful. Um, uh, at times, um, you know, the standards aren't there, and and this this is a sustainability problem for us. You know, as as we move forward with things like, you know, uh, you know, agribusiness incubation and so on, who's actually handling that process on the ground, and you know, what's happened in the places where in the places where uh, incubation models have been established and have been successful, a couple of things. One, there's a solid. Um, Commitment on behalf of the of the local government to to work with USDA to work with EcoCert uh, and so on to meet those standards so that they can start doing third party certifications and so on. Um, you know, so without that commitment, it's very difficult. You know, it's easy. It, it, it's like the concept of technical assistance. It's very easy for me to send a team of three or four people down, work with five companies. You know, they come back with twenty new products and everyone's happy. It's not sustainable. Uh, you know, sustainability means having that incubation program on the ground, getting entrepreneurs the resources they need, and certification is part of that. Um, beyond organic, uh, I, it's it's a shot in the dark. You know, um, you know, I, I I know a guy in Kampala who will certify any product you have uh, kosher, <laughs> without even seeing it. He's not Jewish, uh, but yet he's authorized by the Orthodox Union. To certify, if if Unilever wants his number, by the way, uh, it's very, it's a great time and money saver. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of loopholes out there. So uh, you know, but uh, anyway, that answers your question. Uh, we can take one more. I, I was going to end on that bright note, but uh, you've been. Um, 
Um, I'll, I'll talk about, I didn't talk about this, but um, in the, in the discussion, but they're one of our suppliers and my colleague, Alan Schwartz, who lives in Mozambique and I run 24 different sustainable forestry initiatives where we build products like furniture, um, high value jewelry. We just launched a personal care product line um, over a year and a half ago in the South African market. Um, and basically, if it's not grown in Mozambique, we don't put it in because we want to develop um, the skill set, but mainly like the confidence for them to actually do it themselves. So this is not the kind of stuff that they'd sell on the side of the street. It's like really high value product. Um, inevitably, some of the artisans actually do sell, pr principally like the jewelry or something off on the side of the street. But you kind of have to work with the the groups to understand that, like you know, we had Gucci interested in our bracelets that they diminish their value of the product if they try to sell it on the side of the street for, you know, uh, whatever, like 300 Medi-Cal as opposed to something like selling an $80 bracelet that they could go back into the artisan group. So, um, and then we do programs on the ground where by they grow their own food. So it's like cashews, like mangoes, all that other coconuts. Um, and a lot of the coconut oil is used um, in the beauty products, but they could actually drink the coconut water. But in, it, they're just like any, anybody else, like they get sick of drinking coconut water after a while or whatever. But it's, um, it really is a true like community sustainable development program. And I know at least I could speak to some of the artisans where we're, we're a little bit more hands off, um, that a lot of the community sustainable development is, is, is important to them. The Ugandan bark cloth has been always a very um, coveted uh, cloth material in Africa. A lot of the a lot of the fabric material actually came from Java. Um, a lot of the material in Africa originally was bark cloth for clothing. Um, so a, a, a number of the the textiles that you see come from China. They were imported in from Java quite a while ago, and that has been developed into the African culture. Um, but some of those traditional products are already used within their traditional sense. It's just about taking those traditional project products and now making them more relevant in the modern day market. I'll just add one thing, um, which is one of the things that we've found beyond um, the living wage or more than a living wage, um, and then beyond health care, which are necessities, um, what we have found is um, primary education um, is, is critical. Right, because that is the extra added thing, right, that adds hope and actually helps build the economies. Um, and so that's the other added thing, especially in Africa, that we've done. And I can't tell you the way primary education works, because I've done it um, in the South African townships, is when you go in and educate and at the same time feed, because we link it with our World Food Program initiative, that's where you're providing a lot of added value, right, because you're taking care of the kids, right, whose parents are often. Um, are often out there um, helping make uh, the, the ingredients for your products. Um, and so that's a huge effort. And there's a lot of great stuff happening in Africa around building schools and, and the focus around there. So. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll just you know, kind of uh, reiterate what everyone else is saying. I, I, you know, for us, most of our sustainable uh, initiatives revolve around economic stability um, at the local community level. It, it's important for, uh, as other speakers have mentioned, you know, it's important, you know, from a supply standpoint. And, and it, for us, it's important from a development standpoint. You know, I think we, you know, looking at different programs, I, I was just thinking when you were talking about the schools that, you know, one of the things that we hope to develop is, you know, the concept of culinary education, which outside of select countries in Africa is very, Difficult. I, you know, I, I had a gentleman. This was probably last year, I think it was. Had a gentleman in uh, in Uganda who told me he'd rather his son be dead than become a chef. And you know, we have kids who are the same age, so we were, you know, chatting about how how miserable they are and and whatnot. <laughs> and um, and he had made that comment, and I said, "Wow, that's you know, that's a little harsh." And uh, you know, so I asked him what his justification was for that, and he's like, "Well, look, you know, I, I eat because I I, I don't want to drop dead. You know, I don't eat for enjoyment." And and you can see that, you know, for anyone who's been to Uganda, you know, Uganda is not, is not Senegal. It's not, you know, it's, this is not a very tangible cuisine. You have, you know, ugalis and fonios and, you know, very dry staple, don't die food products. Um, <laughs> so, so it's not really there. So it's no wonder that this gentleman doesn't really see the enjoyment in eating the way that, you know, the way that we would. Um, 
And, and that's a long-term solution, I think. So, you know, we're actually working now with a, a few different groups to not only implement, you know, culinary education programs, but, you know, work on, ex you know, uh, uh, chef exchanges um, with the restaurant associates here in New York um, and, and similar things to that. Because, it, again, it, I mean, for us directly, it has no impact. But long term, it certainly does for companies, you know, for food companies in general who want to source from places like Uganda, you know, value added food, you know, finished food products. You know, it's important to protect the environment. It's important to protect, uh, you know, the workforce and the primary education. And it's also important to stimulate, you know, that, that kind of entrepreneurial creativity. You know, it's, you know, the, it's like the border between Zambia and Malawi. It's almost like that, uh, I don't know, I remember seeing it once, the Married with Children episode where one side of the island was all green and the other side was brown. And it's like that, you know, Zambia, there's entrepreneurs everywhere. Everybody's an entrepreneur. Um, developing all, you know, not just food, but, you know, so, you know, for, for myself, it, it, you know, it's stimulating to see. And Malawi, not so much, you know. Um, so, anyway, I think it's a cultural thing, and so, I, anyway, I, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so. Join me in thanking Jim and Summer and Mike.